I'm Glenn McGinnis and this is Outburst. This week, will tighter restrictions work to slow the spread of COVID-19? It's uh, a balancing act because you can't shut down our economy. Stay in your own bubble. It would have to be total and for a limited length of time. I think it's a self-imposed restrictions that we have to worry about. The government can't do it all. Safe to say the second wave of the novel coronavirus is already underway in different parts of the country. Huge spikes in Western Canada, as well as in Ontario and Quebec, have some areas beefing up restrictions in hopes of beating it back. It would force businesses to close down once again, perhaps adding to the economic damage already inflicted during the first wave. But is shutting it all down the answer? Our question. Will tighter restrictions work to slow the spread of COVID-19? Well, like in restaurants, I mean, you know, some restaurants are doing a good job, but I see some restaurants are still, it's quite full and they're not really following the protocols of distancing and having partitions and for, you know, for the people who's in the restaurant. Uh, I think people uh, taking their own personal uh, approach to it and uh, just showing kind of, kind of decency to their fellow humans, they'll be uh, a lot better than government control, in my opinion. I think that people have to be aware of what they can do and stay apart from each other, stay in your own bubble, and as well as wear masks in common areas, definitely. I don't think so. No. <laughs> Once it's here, it's here. So I think no. Depends on what we're restricting. I think uh, restrictions work so far. We have to be very careful in terms of uh, what we are doing, uh, in terms of what we uh, have restrictions are rolled out but uh, it all depends on what's, uh, what's m m meant by the tighter restriction. Um, I believe it will flatten the curve, but I think in order to completely get rid of COVID is if we find a vaccine. And I believe they're like working on that. And hopefully ne by next year will be improved. But I know that if we social distance and we sanitize with our hands, or mask, it really, it really benefits us all. I think it would be self-imposed tighter restrictions. I think, you know, don't go to a wedding with 250 people. A small gathering, you're still just as married. I think it's a self-imposed restrictions that we have to worry about. The government can't do it all. We, 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 the people, have to do some of it. I don't think so. I think at this point in time, the people that are doing what they're doing, as they, you know, they're not doing anything. They're not going to do anything. They're never going to be taught anything. Uh, we don't let people in who uh, who are suspect, who who may be who may be a threat. So we're fortunate to be on an island, and a, 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 a total ban. It would have to be total and for a limited length of time, but whether it's practical to do that, I'm sure I don't know. I don't know. I think we did enough at the beginning to prevent it, as long as now. If we stay in this bubble, McNeil's talked about, well, for Nova Scotia anyway, uh, I think we'll be okay. It's, I don't know what the other provinces are doing, like for Quebec and Ontario. They're the ones that seem like they're really suffering, but and I don't. As, as long as we, we can't travel there and they can't travel here without tight restrictions, I think we'll be okay. I don't think we need, as of the Atlantic provinces, actually internally, I don't think we need to do anything more. I think so. Yeah, I, I think we need to be kept down pretty much. Of course, it's nice to be an island. Are you from here? Yeah, see if, you, if you're an island surrounded by water is very good. But I think certainly for places where they have a high density of people, you have to be real careful. Well, it seems like uh, everybody's getting fatigued with uh, uh, staying home and trying to trying to do the right thing. I mean, we're lucky here in Newfoundland that it, the population is is uh, is sparse and diverse and spread out. I think that that's the only thing that's saving us here. When I mean, you look at M Montreal and Ottawa, Toronto, it's the population numbers that are just causing. There's no way of 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 continually separating yourself from humanity. It's, it doesn't seem like it's possible. It's uh, a balancing act because you can't shut down our economy. So I think they need to, need to do a better job of testing, have faster testing available, um, shut down. 
I guess, some, not shut down, but limit or restrict or have additional testing in um, airports and flights and things like that. Here in, here in Newfoundland, we're, I believe, doing a very good job, but most of the cases we have right now are for travel. Depends on the restrictions. Uh, I think international travel is a big issue. Um, I, I agree with my husband, what he said about where if your population is sparse, it's a lot easier to deal with. I feel bad for people in very densely populated cities where it's almost impossible to stay six feet apart. It's just ridiculous. I don't know what, what the answer is, really. I don't. My nurse girlfriend says yes, so I'm going to say yes as well. <laughs> Um, but I think certainly listening to the medical experts would be the best option. I think the people can be responsible enough on their own without these extra rules. I think these rules are going to, well, you're downtown, you see how decimated it is. Businesses are closing everywhere. And uh, no, I think it's an overreaction, personally. It should slow the spread because we are still investigating. We don't know what's going on, whatever. So we do have to take the precaution. We don't know what it is, we don't know what's happening. So unless we take precaution, things are gonna get worse and worse. I think until people start truly accepting the fact that the restrictions are being put in place with good reason, they're not just being done to impede your daily life, it's not going to matter. It's based on science, it's not uh, something uh uh, which is uh, disinformation or, or, or wishful thinking, I would say. So it's, science tells it, so it's, I believe in that. By the end of 2021, most single-use plastics will be banned in Canada. That includes plastic bags, straws, cutlery, and those six-pack rings you find around beverages. Nearly 15 billion plastic bags are used every year, and nearly 57 million plastic straws are used every day. It does not include things like plastic garbage bags, plastic food wrap, or plastic beverage containers and lids. The federal government's aim is to have zero plastic waste by the year 2030. But we took to the streets to see if you are a fan of the ban. Our question. Do you support a national ban on single-use plastics? Yes and no, because I think with national ban plastics, uh, people are going to want to, you need plastic to live. So no, I don't actually support it. Doing without the bags, uh, people are going to find another way to use plastics. Plastic is a colossal contaminant, which it seems to last forever. And we become so used to it that we, we again are, are careless without really being cognizant of, uh, of, the, of the harm it does. Uh, if, we could, uh, if we could just make it clear the death and injury caused to uh, sea life and land life that uh, plastics cause, um, I think there'd be a difference. I think there'd be a change. Yes. Why? Because of the state of the environment, and, you know, this is the rivers, the lakes, the oceans, everything, it's nothing but plastic, and it's not necessary. I do. We're from Prince Edward Island, and we, I think we were the first province that actually introduced that, and um, it took a few months to get used to, but after a couple of months, it's just second sense to bring bags with you. I got my own bag from home today and it'd be certainly great for the environment in the long run. Yes. Yeah. I know I've, I've used plastic all the time and uh, it's uh, something that is a hazard to the environment. And uh, I think it's a good idea now that we, we did without it years ago with plastic bags. We've always used paper bags and uh, it's good to get back to, to, back, uh, to the old days where it used to be. Now we're all going back to paper again. So it's, um, it just needs to be looked at, not just a, uh, a jump and a uh, election promise, but they need to actually look at it thoroughly, which a lot of times this Liberal government does not. They just jump at it and put policies in place and don't worry about how to implement those policies. Well, single-use plastic, possibly, yeah, if we can do it. 
I mean, there's so much plastic in the world, and I think the biggest, one of the biggest issues now we're going to have to deal with is waste management. Waste management is monumental. And the more we keep adding to our waste, the worse the problem's going to get. So yeah, the brakes have got to go on. The right answer should be yes. I don't think they're going necessarily about it the right way. Like I think I don't think believe that plastic bags in stores are single use. I think a lot of people do reuse them. However, the food packaging that you buy your food in or that you put your fresh produce in, that's the single use bags that they should be targeting more than the, the carrier bags that you get at the, uh, at the checkout. I think people you do use them again, it's the other stuff and the, f the way the food's packaged from the people you, you purchase it from that should be looked at more. There's too much plastics in our oceans and everywhere else and we did without them for years and years and years. Surely God we can go back to it. They're very new. At my age, they're very new in them. Yeah. I think we can get rid of them. The thing is, you see, you say single-use plastics and everybody thinks of the carrier bags, but if you go to the supermarket, everything is in plastic. And you come home with mountains of it, even if you've brought a little uh, cloth bag to bring it home with. It's, it's a very difficult situation. I can't speak on Canadian side, but I believe that every citizen on this planet should uh, look after uh, what we leave behind us. And, uh, and the man's may help or may not help, but it's uh, about the people's choices. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's an easy thing for us to be able to change our lives around. I mean, you know, so what if I don't get my little green stir stick when I go to the coffee shop? You know, that doesn't that's that's a minor inconvenience compared to the sheer volume of those kinds of things that are produced in the world that cause harm to the planet so I'm willing to make that risk and or to make that sacrifice and I think other sh people should be willing to do that too the minor inconveniences are exactly that minor if the focus was on actually doing the recycling and not banning other things maybe we could get to a point without more bans where we're replacing one thing with another that will also get thrown out I don't know what the replacement will be for the utensils and you know in the businesses that do survive is there a plan for that i haven't read anything about that so and it's mo mostly impacted more in africa i believe because there's a lot of plastics that are like dumped in the ocean because there's not a good system of um sorting all the materials so I actually don't because I think Canada isn't the biggest uh, user of plastic in the world. We have to do it uh, more responsibly, right? We should try to phase it out more slowly rather than have it a national ban right away. Plus, the oil industry in Alberta is going to be affected too much as well. So people are going to be losing their jobs because we'll be using less plastic. I think it needs to happen in more staged ways. You know, if they would recycle, then that would be probably all right. But they don't. So I think it's better just to ban it altogether. I think it's just better for all of us, um, the production of it, the um, having to clean it up all the time. I work in retail and uh, we're slowly getting out of it, which is great because we don't have to, one, dish it out and uh, it helps keeps our area of the world clean as well. I'm very concerned about environmental stuff, but here I am wearing gloves that are kind of vinyl. <laughs> so it's a little hard to say, but uh, definitely we got to find a different way or a better way or a safer way to, um, to handle our planet. Which world-famous landmark was almost temporarily relocated to Canada? Leading Tower of Pisa, Eiffel Tower, or Golden Gate Bridge? The Golden Gate Bridge? Yeah, I was going to go for Golden Gate Bridge as well. Uh, Eiffel Tower? I'm going to say Eiffel Tower. I'm going to say Golden Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge. Eiffel Tower. Um, the Eiffel Tower. Let's yeah. see the Eiffel Tower. All right. In the 1960s, Jean Drapeau was the charismatic mayor of Montreal. Long before his Olympic Stadium project occupied the landscape, Drapeau attempted to have the Eiffel Tower temporarily relocated to Canada. It has been said that a secret agreement was arranged between Jean Drapeau and French President Charles de Gaulle to simply borrow the Eiffel Tower for Expo 67, dismantling the structure in Paris and reassembling it in Montreal. However, the plan never materialized 
after it was allegedly vetoed by the company that operated the tower. But the tower's influence can still be observed in Quebec today. If you look closely, you can see four mini Eiffel Towers atop the turrets of Montreal's Jacques Cartier Bridge. Since the pandemic hit last March, the way many of us conduct our day-to-day -day lives has shifted dramatically. Many of us stay at home more and go out less, and this can also have an effect on how much we buy and how often we do it. We took to the streets to ask Canadians how COVID-19 has had an influence on how and what they purchase. Our question. How has the pandemic changed how you spend your money? Well, I'm retired, so uh, we're spending more time at home, um, but I wasn't going to work anyway, so uh, um, really I come down here for a coffee every day and spend my five bucks and uh, go to the gym now, um, and uh, I don't think it's changed much. We. We're traveling, we're planning to travel across Canada and that wasn't available, but we still spent 40 days on our motorhome this year. I just renovated my entire kitchen a year in advance um, because I didn't spend that money on a vacation. So uh, for me, it's been quite nice. Um, we've definitely had struggles as well. My partner had to go on reduced hours, so that affected things a little bit, but um, not enough to, to not have the savings that we needed, which is good. Yeah, you have to be a bit more wary because, you know, for a lot of people, job security is a big issue. So you have to have that cushion. So, you know, you're, you're saving a lot more. So, yeah, definitely a bit more wary about where you're spending your money. There's a lot less going out to eat and spending it on kind of uh, things like that. So there has been more um, money available for focusing on uh improving things at home and um, doing things as a family from our home. So uh, in that regard, I guess it is. I have spent more <laughs> because I'm home more and I am a teenager. Well, I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm a young adult and I like online shopping. So <laughs> that's probably <laughs> my answer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I spend a lot more money now online. I do a lot of online shopping or if I go out for dinner with my family, I'll spend a little, a few extra bucks on some food and some drinks. I, spending problems definitely have skyrocketed throughout the pand pandemic, for sure. I managed to save a lot of money because all my vacation got canceled. I got some money back. I can't do much. I can't go to a movie. I can't go to a concert. So, yeah, definitely has impacted. That's the only impact of COVID for me that is the most noticeable. My lifestyle has completely and drastically changed. Overall, I'm probably spending less money um, and more money locally. Like, it's just made me kind of realize the importance of supporting your local economy. I don't think it's affected the way I spend my money all that much. Um, I'm fairly frugal, so I don't eat out often or anything like that. So that hasn't really affected you know me going out I, I don't normally anyways so that's probably the simple answer to that question yeah actually it really hasn't my wife's a full-time nurse and so she's just been working the same amount of hours as usual so all we've been doing more is just probably we've just been spending more at the restaurants just to help the local ones in town it's honestly saved me a lot of money i know for a lot of people they got more into ordering out and you know, taking advantage of delivery services uh, that businesses have. But me personally, it's forced me to actually look into what's in my fridge and actually start to cook from home. And then now when I do order out, it's more of a luxurious thing. It's like something that I'm doing to treat myself. So I've spent, a, or I used to spend so much more money. Now, during the pandemic, I'm spending much less. Okay, what about you? Uh, same thing as her. I don't spend as much money anymore. Uh, I barely go out, so I cook more than I, when I eat out. Ooh. <laughs> um, when we were on quarantine and locked at home, I definitely, my spending habits changed a lot. It saved a lot of money. And looking back now, since we were able to go out and spend our money, like I realized how much I was spending before compared to when we were locked at home. Um, kind of made me like hone in on my spending, I think. Become less materialistic, I guess. I never had any money to spend to start with. Um, has it changed? I think I buy more of what I need instead of what I want. And I buy more local. Online. I, I spend it online. I don't go anywhere. 
Oh, I didn't. For sure. Okay. Yeah. I spend a lot more, though, I find. <laughs> um, yeah. I spend more because you're online and you're, you're, you're scrolling and you're going, oh, yeah. I think it's changed how I spend my money in that um, I'll, I'll often go to places like um, and spend maybe a lot more like and, and buy a whole lot more of, of items that I need versus making a whole lot of small trips. Um, just get everything done on one trip type of thing. Less exposure for, for everybody. <laughs> uh, well, at first I spent a lot less on gas uh, staying at home and a lot less on coffee being at home. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, lots of people I know have spent more on home improvements and a lot, of, a lot of money goes into your living environments when you're forced to be there and less on travel, obviously. We, we rarely go shopping, like we're avoiding malls, we're avoiding crowds, so I'm not an online shopper, so yeah, there's more in the bank account, no doubt. I'm much more frugal now. I'm always trying to look ahead, always trying to save whatever I can, just in case, it, especially if it happens again. That's a very real possibility, although I think we have more knowledge to help prevent it a bit more now, but... Federal politics isn't everyone's cup of tea, and that's become fairly obvious in past years with low voter turnout during federal elections. It can be attributed to voter apathy, brought on by general dissatisfaction with government or with politicians in general. It could also mean that people are simply not informed enough about the issues. So we took to the streets to find out what would make you more engaged. Our question. What would make you more interested in federal politics? If we didn't have as much vitriol as we do today, I think a lot more people would be engaged in the way politics are. If you look back in the, the 40s and 50s, certainly there was a, a, a certain amount of vitriol, of course, but there was also a lot more engagement. And I think with, um, without that kind of engagement, you're never going to get back to that day where people were willing to work with each other. I guess the biggest thing would be like having people who are more relatable to like someone like me in my age, my demographic. I think just more of an input into what's really going on. I, there might be, I just I, have, I don't really know much about the politics, but I feel like if more people had more of an opinion, then things might be a little bit better. It's not really taught to children at a young age, honestly. Like, it's just something that's sort of left up to people as they grow older. I wasn't really into it until I was at least 20. It was just something that was never offered when I was growing up. So it should be introduced into the educational system. I think having more, um, having more access to the Member of Parliament. Uh, I think if the cast of characters were more relatable, uh, it would be a little bit more interesting. And I don't mean like caricatures like you see in other countries necessarily, but um, just interesting people in politics with strong charisma would make it more interesting. It's crazy. There's not a lot of my demographic that goes out and votes. It's sad, really, because we're, I think, 60-something 60, 60 percentage of the voters, and you don't see that in the polls. You see my mom's age and like seniors going out to vote. Less childishness, if that's the right word I can find. More real discussion, less, yeah, less, you know, bantering back and forth about ridiculous things. They don't do what they promised. So, I mean, but I mean, that's just life in general, I guess. People are, you know, they try to promote things and tell you they're gonna do something and kind of leave you in a lurch once they get into higher up into the government type thing, so. A lot of it's like the same things over and over again though, like a little bit more diversity in terms of like party platform, like major parties as well. Like I just feel like it, it's basically, it's basically a two party system without it being a two party system. Um, so I might be more interested if there was like something pushing the politics forward in Canada, I guess. I guess I am interested in federal politics, but I guess, uh, seeing them discuss uh, a wide variety of issues that would affect uh, my everyday life or the everyday lives of the people around me and seeing real change being done uh, versus um, arguments between political and party lines, but that there's progress being made on the things that matter to me would be make me sure, make sure that I'm being informed and interested in what's being discussed. But when they do something good, 
for people in need and stuff like that. You know, I do like that, especially when it comes down to like homeless people and people with addictions, because I used to be addicted. And uh, yeah, when it comes to helping out the less fortunate, I, I like that. I guess I become interested in federal politics when it affects my day to day, my family, my life, my home. Um, so as soon as it starts to affect me, I pay a lot more attention. Um, I think thinking back to the curriculum, what we learned in elementary, junior high, um, there wasn't a huge focus. It wasn't that interesting. And perhaps if we started really teaching children at a younger age and really involving them in politics a little bit more, kind of from the, the get-go, um, we could have a higher level of engagement. You become a very a better citizen. You, you have a better appreciation of how the rule get decide where the money gets spent and why it gets spent there and everything. I really wish that we had a society mature enough to be more politically invested. We need a new leader real fast. The quicker is quicker the better. I think if it was more tailored to the youth, because I'm 18 myself, so I'm not completely well versed in the politics realm so I think if they had more people my age kind of voting and showing you what to do kind of thing it would help a lot and that's just how I feel about it I don't know I think maybe just the way in which it's 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 presented I think there has to be you know it, it's it seems to be like an old system I, I think that you know if, if it was if it comes down to you know the engagement with people and and how you're able to communicate with politicians that that's you know makes it more effective to how they're communicating their message I think that that's really important for people um, yeah I you know I it's hard for me to say because I feel I am quite engaged I you know I read a lot and and things like that but uh, I think for maybe uh, you know the next generations they are a lot more on social media and things like that so I think it's just more about relating to them and, and making sure that you're delivering your message in a way that they understand. So, Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on the Cable Public Affairs Channel. I'm Glenn McGinnis. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. It's your turn to speak up, and we're listening.